sir, we are close to 60 participants. We are almost 60. I think we are good to go. A very good evening and a warm welcome from DESNU, the Department of English, Sister Nivedita University, to all of you here. This is the first edition of a new online series of talks that our department will be organizing. And we are calling this series Literature Talks. I would request our mentor and advisor, Professor Shubhid Dhar, to kindly offer the opening remarks. Thank you, Professor Shudhari. I think as a uh, Prubal, that is Professor Ochilvari, has already told you, this is a very new series that we are going to start from Desi, Desi, Department of English, Sister Nivedita University. We already have many successful uh, programs or platforms pulled out. For example, a very successful Saturday with a scholar evening. This is a new one which is special for a number of reasons. First of all, literature, you understand, talks is both in the sense of noun as well as a verb. Literature talks is all about young people, young scholars, young teachers giving us inputs about the very recent new developments in particular English literature studies. And we are starting off, as we all know, with a couple of lectures on gender and on queer. These are subjects that have come to the fore in the last maybe 10, 15 years. And in Kolkata, are also engaged in serious academic reflections on these topics. So this is and in the future, we will have many such exciting topics. For instance, one of the things that we are thinking about in Desmio is having a lecture on which, once again, is something which is rather, you know, which is very emergent at this moment of time. And so, without any further ado, because obviously you don't want to listen to me, you want to listen to Professor Monikin Kinibasu, and you want to listen to Professor Shomuji Chandro. Uh, I will uh, end my opening remarks at this point and once again pass over the microphone to my colleague, Professor Tuval Roy Chaudhary. Thank you, sir. Uh, a warm welcome once again to all the participants here and especially to my colleague, uh, Professor Manikin Kinibasu, and also to Professor Shomuji Chandro who has very kindly agreed to join us. I will introduce, I will formally introduce both of them uh, to our, to this session. And uh, we will have both of them speaking on the subject, gender and queer. Uh, we will have uh, Professor Monique Kinkinibashu making her presentation first, followed by Professor Shomajit Chandra's talk. And at the end of the session, we will be open to a question answer session. And uh, you can type your questions in the chat box, and the speakers will take it up one by one. Uh, Professor Monique Kinkinibashu is you know, uh, uh, presently an assistant professor at Sister Nivedita University in the Department of English. She completed her master's in English literature from the Department of English, University of Kolyani, and she is presently a doctoral research scholar at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. Her area of specialization is gender, film, masculinity, and culture studies. She was actively involved as a technical assistant in the theater spectators since 2015, she has published and presented papers on film and literature and has been teaching courses pertaining to literature and visual arts. And she has also 
recently published in Rendezvous of Reporter under Ukiyoto Publishers on the Politics of Translations in Tagore's Raktokarabi. Coming to introduce Professor Shomaji Chandra. Uh, Professor Chandra is affiliated with the Department of English at the Bhavanipur Education Society College as a lecturer and is currently pursuing his PhD on 20th century tantric travel narratives with Jadavpur University. His MPhil dissertation was on the depiction of Dionysus in the works of Frederick Nietzsche. Professor Chandra is also an enthusiast of Indian literature. His interests include classical and early modern European literature, continental philosophy, postmodernism, and queer studies. Besides, he loves to paint and experiment with poetry and translation. With these words, let us extend a warm welcome from the Department of English, Sister Nivedita University, to both of them and to all of you. And I would request now Professor Manikinki Nivasu to begin her talk. So I'm audible and visible. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much, uh, sir. So first to Professor Thor, and second to Professor Rajyoti. Thank you so much uh, for thinking about uh, the young scholars, thinking about uh, a new dimension of uh, looking at topics, keeping it simple. Uh, like I have been told to talk about gender, so obviously that makes me uh, feel a little privileged because I can talk whatever I feel like about gender because I don't have to bind my uh, talk to any particular uh, aspect of gender. Uh, so I've taken the liberty, I have kept it short, I will not bore you to death. So uh, I will start with World Health Organization's definition of gender. And uh, the reason being that we are in the middle of a pandemic. So the first concern is that what does the health front say about something? So WHO defines gender in these terms. And you will find it all in uh, on the internet. So this is information. Nevertheless, you can just give it a listen. Gender refers to the characteristics of women, men, girls, and boys that are socially constructed. This includes norms, behaviors, and roles associated with being a woman, man, or boy, as well as relationships with each other. As a social construct, gender varies from society to society and can change over time. A very uh, interesting definition, according to me. So when the definition sinks in, finally, uh, the concept of the scientific identity of an individual is barred with the word like uh, socially construct. Okay, we, we get these words here. It gives me hope. Why is it called socially constructed? But then the hope subsides. Why? The limiting of gender to uh, the two beings, uh, of course, man or boy, girl or woman, we know that again, gender has been stereotyped. So if one looks for the word gender on the internet. The page is completely filled with medical concepts and safety threats. So one after the other, the thread opens and you are going to get more and more uh, intensive definitions at that point in time. It's very astonishing. Why is this astonishing? It's astonishing to find that the academicians like us, uh, who tries to look at gender, after having looked at feminism through the lenses of theoretical understanding as a student, when we look forward and try to analyze why gender, what has uh, the aspects of gender been, we travel into unknown territory. And uh, thereafter, the comfort zone becomes the known territory. Then what are the known territories? The feminist theory. Or something that we all know, I just, uh, quickly touch upon and then maybe proceed. Like when we are sailing through wool and bubo, 
and first wave feminist criticism and we will then go to second wave feminist criticism and then to Kate Millett and her sexual and sexual politics and then we will come to uh, gyno criticism with Ellen Schalter and uh, we will drift towards the French feminist we will go to Julia Kristeva, we will go to Helena Pito and we will go to Luz Erigen. So uh, these are the known waters. So the question is, uh, why and how and uh, from where the gender studies evolve? Now, if you are looking for further information and if you are bent that we want to know about gender, you will find out that in of the three started that later led to gender studies departments across the globe. This is something that we are aware of. But then, why is gender studies taken up to be an interdisciplinary uh, course? The interdisciplinary tag associated with gender studies is often because the oppression of the thought had united the minds of most disciplines. Like for example, sociology, literature, political science, and you can add on to the list. This has actually led to a combined reading of the new problems of othering as a prospective narrative of their interpretation. As a result, what happens is with Judy Butler writing uh, Gender Troubles and writing the preface in 1999, uh, she has written this in her 1999 presses. She has written quite a number of presses. This is the one written in 1999. Ten years ago, I completed the manuscripts of Gender Trouble and sent it to Rutledge for publication. I did not know that the text would have as wide an audience as it had, nor did I know that uh, it would constitute a provocative intervention in feminist theory. Why was it considered to be an intervention is something that we are not really aware of. We, uh, when we look at the word intervention, we are uh, given by our mind a few synonyms. A kind of interruption, a kind of disruption, a kind of stop, and uh, a kind of rebeating. So while the feminist theory was at all in the first place uh, evolved into a kind of uh, interruption with the publication of gender trouble. So what does Patra do? Patra talks about gender hierarchy, the constitution of various classes based on your gender, the construction of gender, how gender is a constructed identity, of course, then Butler goes on to talk about subversive and unsubversive expressions of gender. And also talks about the prospect of power and identity in gender. So how the power and, <clears throat> and identity play a huge role in formulating the gender of an individual or in I think there is some some technical problem. Uh, let's wait. Uh, I think there is some network issue at MB's end. Yes, sir. Well, frankly, I don't blame the network. What with water logging everywhere, things are a little dicey.
sir even if it's not water log then also things are dicey given the <laughs> dicey nature of technology <laughs> Yes, it's like students, isn't it? You know, sometimes they are very well behaved, at other times they are not. Sir, should I give her a call, or we can wait for her to rejoin? No, I think you know you should give her a call. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. I'm trying. Well, for one, I'm sure you'll agree that nothing beats a real face-to-face -face seminar. Absolutely, sir. Uh, did I get disconnected by any chance? I yes, sorry. yes. Uh, yes. I'm facing some network issues. Yeah, welcome back. Oh, so sorry. So, uh, like I was saying, so uh, the concept of uh, the concept of gender being, uh, therefore, itself being an idea of existence, it makes itself a dichotomy. Its, its presence becomes very dichotomous. Now, why uh, the presence is dichotomous is because everyone claims to have a hint about gender. So when uh, I started thinking about what to say about uh, gender, I was thinking that there are so many things and chronology is so huge. Perhaps I will keep on speaking. But then when I started thinking about why will I talk about these things, these are information, and gender studies would rather be a consciousness, so I thought of uh, limiting my talk to certain ideas and then maybe taking up the talk again once you ask some questions. So therefore, gender carves itself out as an idea of existence. That much is uh, there for us. And then uh, it makes itself a dichotomous presence, and everyone claims to have a hint about it. Cannot be summed up by any particular definition or denomination. This is what I can deduce from gender that it does not have a particular definition. It's very difficult to define something which is, uh, which is so which is so, uh, you know, evolving, so to say. So Butler or, or keeps on arguing about these stances. And Butler says that far from being a set of fixed and stable values and roles assigned or imposed by society, gender is therefore a performance or a role enacted by an individual. With that, Butler brings in the aspect of performance and performativity into, uh, you know, uh, performativity into the aspect of uh, gender studies. So, what happens is that the performance of gender becomes number one enacted, number two it becomes validated, and number three it becomes framed by the society. 
so what the society is gradually doing with gender is that it is creating its own version of uh, the concept and highlighting certain things that make the identity of an individual uh, related to the gendered identity that is being uh, put on that individual so the role is uh, a little two faced let's put it like this it's it's uh, it's multi dimensional for ease of understanding according to me but the gender is not a fixed category that is the point so the meaning is dependent on multiple things if you if you look at it properly you will see that the gen the first meaning the, the meaning of gender would first depend on the location so because gender is not sex because sex is biological gender is social these are the things that we have been uh, like you know internalizing since forever so if that is true then gender can change according to the location of a particular person or a particular identity number 2 it can change with time it can evolve with time it can have it can have an impact as and when the cultural framework of the particular thing changes so maybe a person in a particular cultural frame is behaving in a different way than a person in another cultural frame and of course the gender expression is a uh, somewhat there is some kind of a fluidity associated with uh, the expression of gender so when you are looking at the identity of an individual let's say today the identity need not be the same 20 years from now the role playing the kind of uh, you know the fervor the idea uh, can actually change in fact uh, uh, at one point in time that is also true that uh, okay. yeah so it's also true that language plays a very important role in uh, determining the citation of a sign and also uh, professor pramod kinayar had uh, said this that it becomes a repetitive enactment of language so i don't really agree with the fact that it is a repetitive enactment of language but i do agree with the repetitive part of it that once you are repeating the aspect of gender it somehow gives a kind of fixture to the idea thus therefore we can say that uh, gender can be read as a performance it can be read as a changing evolving performance a changing evolving identity it can be read as a fluid performative so there are multiple ways in which uh, you can read gender you can also read gender from a materialistic point of view you can say that it adds a class a kind of uh, identity a kind of uh, analytical category to its particular uh, you know um, how to put it or uh, maybe uh, i would say yeah like i have I said it's con- kind of uh, it's a combination of identity so you are basically creating uh, a new identity through the seepage of gender into your uh, sex so you, what you are doing is basically creating a social identity based on uh, your perception of the society and the society's perception of course then there are the uh, literary canons talking about gendered reading we have women writing we have men writing from a different perspective we have women writing as uh, men for the fear of not getting accepted we all have uh, read that other such texts where women are the actual writers but they have taken pseudonyms and you know these are uh, these are what i think would be the materialistic uh, aspect to it that you are adapting to a gender identity particularly because of the concept that uh, it is important for you to take up this identity for the sake of your um, improvement maybe in or ease i i should say uh, in life also we could go to uh, the different kinds of uh, women writing the identity body politics and of course the concept of subject subjectifying the body so when the butler says in body that matter 
that women are uh, somewhat taken as self sacrificing uh, you know just because the body is taken as a compromise in fact today in the morning i was talking about the concept of power as seen in kanaiya lal's uh, dropadi and how um, we were we would be looking at counter power struggle through the use of and the change over of uh, the politics of the body so the politics of biology and uh, the concept of uh, criticizing the concept of uh, making a change at the gender level would be something that perhaps uh, has not so much to do about the concept of identity but it is because the fluidity of identity and the subject and the subjectivity changing itself so often that the performative becomes a part of your life so uh, that is what i was planning to talk to you about and uh, that is that is where i will finish my part of the talk and uh, over to you sir Uh, thank you, Monique Inkini. Uh, may I now request our second speaker of the day, Professor Shomujit Chandra, to kindly make his presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, very good evening to uh, all the members of the audience, uh, faculty members, speakers, and all the students. Uh, at the very beginning, I would like to thank the Department of English of Sister Nivedita University for having me here today. And I would also like to express my gratitude to Professor Dhar for very generously giving me the opportunity to talk on queer, which has been a topic quite close to my heart. Uh, also, I would like to congratulate Professor Munikinkini Boshu for that deeply erudite talk on gender. Uh, so on that note, I would like to uh, share my screen since I have prepared a presentation for today's evening. Uh, give me a minute, please. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so my first acquaintance with queer studies was in 2015 when uh, Professor Paramita Chakraborty uh, offered an optional course uh, of the same name. And I, along with several other interested candidates, flocked to her class and were introduced to an area of study which is not only very relevant, but it, also, but it has also over the years helped me evolve as both an academician and a human being. Uh, so while I was considering how to approach today's talk, I decided to begin it with an anecdote from my school days. Uh, so uh, I have been a student of a school called the Modern Academy, which is situated in Dhakuria. And we had this school song, a rather innocuous school song, which we have been singing for nine years without any remarkable incident to report about it. But in the 10th year of my time there, I encountered a very different way of singing the song. Uh, so the first two lines of the song were like this, and I quote, every child has a dream, a dream to lead the way, singing songs and holding hands and to be merry and gay, unquote. So for nine years, no one could suspect that this song could be sung in a different way. But in my 10th standard, some boys took to putting a lot of stress on the word gay intentionally. This was their idea of a joke. Uh, so it so happened that they would sing the first line properly. They would go about the second line like this, singing songs and holding hands and to be merry and gay. They would shout out the word at the top of their voice in unison. Now, I was one of the house captains and I found this both embarrassing and amusing. I planned to confront them about this, but decided against it. And poor souls who had composed the school song, they never knew that a certain word could be used in such a way to mock the institution. Now, rest assured, the boys did not have any political motive, uh, nor were they in solidarity with the gay community. This was simply their idea of mocking the institution. So that returned to me. This has stayed with me forever, actually. And uh, it reminded me of the origin of the word gay. And on that note, let us uh, begin with the 
more theoretical aspects of my talk today. Uh, I have devoted this slide to the LGBTQ spectrum. Now, if you would be kind enough to look at uh, this, uh, these uh, lines beneath the word gay, where I have mentioned that the word gay might have been derived from a provencal word gai, G-A-I, which stood for a specific kind of love poetry before coming to signify happy, merry, or impetuous. When uh, Professor Kosta Bokshi was teaching us Funny Boy, uh, which, is, which happens to be a queer classic as part of our course on post-colonial literature in 2016, uh, he mentioned this rather revealing origin of the word gay. He was talking about a very important point in the history of Europe. This was the high middle ages of Europe. And Professor Bokshi went on to say how Frederick Engels wrote about this in his influential text on the origins of family, private property, and state. So it was a significant moment because before the Middle Ages, there was no notion of individual sex love in European society. But at that time, uh, two things were underway, privatization of property and the solidification of bloodlines. And at that point, it became important to control women's sexuality and reproduction. And for that matter, women began to be forced into monogamous heterosexual relationships, to be precise, marriages with men. Uh, but this was a time when the troubadour tradition of poetry was flourishing in the Provencal and Castilian regions of France. And this guy, G-A-I, according to Professor Bokshi, was a certain kind of love poetry within the troubadour tradition, which celebrated parallel sexualities. These areas of France always had a very flourishing tradition of parallel sexualities. And Professor Bokshi said how unrequited love, they celebrated unrequited love, but it was really a euphemism on same-sex love. So that is important, that this was a moment when heteronormativity was being dictated on especially women, if not also on men, but there emerged a kind of love poetry that celebrated other forms of love and sexuality. So we see that this guy, the forerunner of the modern word gay, is being used in a similar subversive sense as was used by my classmates back in 2008. So the objective uh, behind this rather lengthy discourse on the anecdote and that a uh, brief contemplation on the word gay, uh, was to introduce you to certain key ideas related to queer, namely, as you can see, heteronormativity, parallel sexualities, deviant sexualities, and perversion. Heteronormativity happens to be the establishment of the heterosexual couple with a dominant man and a submissive woman as the only acceptable form of sexual relationship in society. And according to Paramita Chakraborty, Professor uh, Paramita Chakraborty, it rests on the three pillars of patriarchy, misogyny, and homophobia. Parallel sexualities always coexist with the heteronormative sexuality in society, but they are denied recognition. And the moment they break decisively with heteronormativity, they are silenced and tabooed as aberrant and deviant. And finally, we come to perversion, which is the opposite of what is considered to be right, acceptable, or legitimate. The moment we are critically analyzing the concept of the perverse, we are also critiquing power. Because always, the people in power decide what would be acceptable and what unacceptable. Therefore, an understanding of perversion is always important while we are trying to learn about queer. But more on that later. I would briefly return to the previous slide. You would see that I've devoted this to the LGBTQIA plus spectrum. Um, and uh, I would like to dwell briefly on each of these categories since I've spent some time talking about the G, it stands for gay. Let us start at the beginning. L stands for lesbian. Now, the word lesbian comes from Lesbos, which was, is an island of the Greek archipelago. And it was home to Sappho, a 7th century BCE 
Greek female poet. She happened to be celebrated as one of the nine lyrics, sorry, lyric poets of ancient Greece. And she very famously established a sorority or a sisterhood on that island in 7th century BCE. And what was her intention? It was her intention to train young women in the arts of love and prepared them for a life of heterosexual relationship with men. Uh, if we read the fragments of poetry by Sappho, which are extant till date, we shall see that these women were engaged in several collective activities and rituals. They were worshipping the goddess Aphrodite, they were culling flowers, weaving garlands, singing songs, and learning the arts of love. But there is also a very deep pathos uh, related to it, because always we have to remember that Sappho was the teacher the older teacher and these young women came to the island and went away to enter into a life of to enter into married life with other men and she would always be the one who was left behind so later poetry about Sappho also reflects this pathos and it is rather disconcerting to note that this uh, tradition of female friendship in ancient Greece was also catering to the needs of heterosexuality in a way uh, Moving on to B and T, which stand for bisexual and transgender, respectively. Uh, I won't dwell on them in a lot of detail uh, due to the paucity of time. Uh, they are comparatively easier to understand, but we must keep in mind that both these categories operate within a binary understanding of gender, which dictates that there are only two kinds of gender, male and female. And for this reason, several members of both the LGBT and non-LGBT communities have had issues with including the bisexual and transgender people under the LGBTQ plus umbrella. Since LGBTQ plus is a spectrum of different sexualities. And uh, these categories cater to a binary understanding of gender, but uh, outlooks change over time. I would come to queer a bit later. I move over to I, which stands for intersex. Intersexed individuals are born with one or several sexual characteristics which do not fit into the binary notions of gender. But it so happens that most intersexed individuals will always relate to either of the two genders, that is male and female. And finally, A stands for asexual, agender or aromantic, the members of which category uh, do not feel any sexual attraction to members of any gender, be it within a binary structure or a non-binary structure. Finally, we come to queer. Queer traditionally means odd, strange, or unnatural. But um, in the late 19th century, it came to be used as a pejorative term for homosexual and effeminate men. On that note, I move on to the second slide of the presentation. Queer, the word queer was used very famously as a term of homo sorry, homophobic abuse by Sir John Sholto Douglas, Earl of Queensbury against Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde was engaged in a tempestuous affair with Alfred Douglas, who was also an English poet and essayist later on in life but he was the son of the Earl of Queensbury. And we can understand that John Sholto did not take the matter very kindly. He employed private detectives to catch this pair of gallivanting young men in the act. And a case was filed against Oscar Wilde and he spoke very eloquently in the defense of his own actions. And I will come back and tell you in more detail uh, about what exactly Oscar Wilde said in his trial. Uh, let me tell you that throughout the 20th century, the word gay began to be used by homosexual men as an identifier, but this was linked to an assimilationist politics. What is assimilationist politics? An effort by homosexual individuals to uh, show that they are not so dissimilar from the heterosexual community after all, but queer Queer began to be reclaimed in the late 1980s as a positive identifier for the LGBT communities. 
because they tend the what tended to remind these people about the sheer amount of insult which they had faced in the past and so to keep them conscious of their difference with the heterosexual community uh, you would also note that the third bullet point says that uh, an early usage is recorded in an anonymous flyer titled queers read this at the new york gay pride parade in june 1990 i will read out a brief excerpt from this flyer and i quote well yes gay is great it has its place but when a lot of lesbians and uh, sorry lesbian and gay men wake up in the morning we feel angry and disgusted not gay so we have chosen to call ourselves queer using queer is a way of reminding us how we are perceived by the rest of the world unquote and as you can note the last bullet point this conference titled queer theory which was organized by influential academician teresa de loritis in 1990 uh, did much to popularize the term queer and help it evolve into an umbrella uh, for the entire lgbtq community though there are several people who do oppose this uh, phenomenon uh, in this slide i have spoken about the scope of the word queer we see that it has three basic manifestations queer activism queer studies and queer theory however apart from being used as an adjective or an abstract noun queer may also be used as a verb to queer something is to question challenge mock and invert accepted standards of gender and sexuality now let us look at these three manifestations of queer one by one queer activism is a sexuality or gender activism which opposes assimilationist politics and asserts and celebrates difference individuality queer theory is um, a post structural critical theory that emerged in uh, the early 1990s and it rests on two things the feminist questioning of sexual essentialism and uh, the opposition of the socially constructed nature of sexual behavior and identity uh, and apart from that um, apart from critically considering uh, members of the gay lesbian and transgender communities queer theory also includes within its analytical purview topics such as cross dressing gender dysphoria and gender corrective surgery queer studies on the other hand is an academic discipline which goes beyond gay studies and lesbian studies and tries to critically consider the entire range of sexuality including heterosexuality and it is also multidisciplinary in nature it is constantly navigating with texts from other disciplines uh, for instance uh, literature history uh, social science media studies and um, cultural studies Uh, and uh, so its objective is to identify instances of queer behavior and identity amongst these various disciplines i would return to slide number 2 and uh, i would like to talk briefly about the emphatic words in which oscar wilde defended himself at his trial and i quote it is in this century such a great affection of an elder for a younger man as there was between david and jonathan plato shakespeare michelangelo it is that deep spiritual affection that is as pure as it is perfect it dictates and pervades great works of art it is in this century misunderstood so much misunderstood that it may be described as the love that dare not speak its name and on that account of it i am placed where i am now it is beautiful it is fine it is the noblest form of affection there is nothing unnatural about it it is intellectual and it repeatedly exists between an older and a younger man when the older man has intellect and the younger man has all the joy hope and glamour of life before him that it should be so the world does not understand the world mocks at it and sometimes puts one in the pillory 
for it, unquote. Now, with reference to these uh, emphatic words with which Oscar Wilde talks about male friendship, I would take you to ancient Greece, 5th century BCE Athens, where pederasty, the second bullet point, please note it is highlighted in pink, pederasty was a popular social practice uh, where an older man or the Erastus would be loving and guiding a younger man or the Eromenos. If you would look at this illustration, a vase illustration from ancient Greece, here is the Erastus, who's the older man, he's bearded, and here is the younger male adolescent who's, uh, who, who hasn't really uh, sprouted facial hair as of yet. The older man would be guiding the young adolescent in the various matters of life, philosophy, and warfare. There would be some erotic activity, there would be some sexual emissions between the legs of the younger individual, but there would be no penetration. And most importantly, in a text like Symposium by Plato, this Greek love or Platonic love, so to say, has been valorized as the higher intellectual form of love that could exist only between men. Uh, men's sexual interactions with women were for the base purpose of procreation. But this was the more sophisticated kind of love, Greek love, which led to immortalization through the creation of intellectual works. Marriage of true minds, if I may borrow the words of Shakespeare, led to intellectual pursuits, led to the inception of great works of art. Uh, this is a homosocial understanding of society, to borrow a term from Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick. Uh, visualization of society where women are excluded from matters of importance and society operates based on the various interactions and commerce between men exclusively. Professor Paramita Chakraborty mentioned this pun on homosexuality. A homosexuality not only means same-sex love, but also human sexuality. Because remember, the scientific name of thinking man is homo sapiens. So homo not only means same, it also means human. And uh, this features very significantly in the research of Sedgwick in her book, Epistemology of the Closet. Sedgwick's, uh, Sedgwick is examining Victorian society and she says how uh, women once again are left out and the society proceeds on several exchanges between men. And also most of Western history is expressed in uh, heterosexual identifiers such as dynasty, marriage, family and, and so on. Uh, and uh, this kind of homosocial outlook can be easily confused with homosexuality, but it is not the same thing. In spite of an existence of a compulsory heterosexuality in society, heteronormativity for that matter, there also exists these undercurrents of the homosocial phenomenon. That is Kosofsky Sedgwick's contention. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, I would briefly talk about Adrian Rich, who was an American poet, essayist, and a leading feminist of her time. In her influential essay, Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence, Adrian Rich talks about an 18th century psychological notion which states that women have a much richer inner and emotional life compared to men. Women would rarely approach men with the kind of need that men would approach women with. And it is Rich's contention that um, since time immemorial, women have been spontaneously engaging with each other, uh, forging friendships, comradeships, and collaborations. However, patriarchy insists on silencing and terminating these female friendships and coercing women into heterosexual relationships by virtue of these eight characteristics of male power, which I have noted in this slide. Uh, if you could just uh, take a few seconds to read through this. Uh, denying women their own sexuality, forcing male sexuality upon women, exploiting female labor, 
controlling and robbing women of their children, confining women physically, limiting women's creativity, using women as objects in male transactions and depriving women of knowledge on the whole. Uh, the next slide is devoted to Gail Rubin's understanding of the sex hierarchy, which uh, talks about how certain forms of sexual activity are valorized over others. Gail Rubin is a cultural anthropologist and a gender activist. Uh, so uh, she, in, in this influential essay of hers, Thinking Sex, she talks about uh, six ideologies that control spontaneous sexual activity of human beings. So in this rather beautifully drawn, drawn diagram, which I have acquired from Queer, a graphic history, we see this uh, inner charmed circle contrasted to the bad outer limits. All pertaining to sexual activity, we see various dichotomies here. We see how monogamy is preferred to promiscuity, free uh, sexual activity uh, to prostitution or, or the vocation of sex workers, um, sexual activity in the domestic space as opposed to public display of affection, or vanilla sex in uh, preference to bondage, sadism, and masochism. So this. These inner, uh, these, these attributes which are present in the inner charm circle, circle uh, so to say, are projected as morally superior choices and they bolster heteronormativity. Uh, we are approaching towards the end of the time which has been assigned to me. So three more slides and I'll be done with my talk. Uh, we come to the very important question, why does society or patriarchy to be precise, feel this need to impose heteronormativity on uh, individuals? On that note, uh, Professor Parmita Chakraborty had remarked once in her queer studies classes that uh, apart from patriarchy, misogyny and homophobia, heteronormativity also works, in, uh, works hand in hand with capitalism. And any capitalist society operates based upon the notion of excess or surplus production. And how is this surplus production to be acquired? Through the unpaid labor of certain individuals, preferably women. Throughout the Victorian era, female day laborers were paid less compared to men. And even Adrian Rich, in the essay, a Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence, she says how female uh, independent women, actually, even in the 20th century, they constantly need to cater to certain ideas of femininity in the workspace in order to survive. Basically, they live up to the expectations from women, which are created by patriarchy. So that is a different question, the exploitation of women in workspaces. But with the rise of capitalism and its critique in the 19th century, it became evident that capitalism was making efforts once more to control female sexuality and reduce women to subordination under men. And that is why the man-woman couple came to be at the center of the entire range of uh, sexualities. Michel Foucault also talks about this issue in his two volumes of the history of sexuality. Michel Foucault happens to be one of the pioneer, pioneering thinkers uh, of queer studies and queer theory. Uh, Foucault says that uh, from 16th to the 18th centuries in Europe, sexuality was subjected to constant surveillance by the church through the mode of the confessional. Uh, we are all aware of this, for instance, a film like The Mask of Zorro, where we see that Elena, the character played by Catherine Zeta-Jones, she goes to church and she's talking to the church father. Um, and she has just seen Zorro. She talks about how she saw a ruggedly handsome youth and her mind was filled with certain kinds of amorous thoughts. The, and Christianity inherently understands uh, sexuality as sinful. So this helps to force people to talk about their erotic dreams, aspirations, and experiences. And so it is 
subjected to a constant form of surveillance. In the 19th century, the church is, uh, I mean, the church is uh, displaced by science and psychiatry. Due to two reasons, due to the emergence of population, as you can see, as a political and economic problem for the first time, and also for the preservation of a capitalistic society. It became important to control people's sexuality and to ensure that people did not waste their time and effort in sexual activities which were non-procreative. There began a series of attempts to force people into procreative sex and nothing beyond that. Any sexual activity that was not for the express purpose of procreation was termed as perverse. Uh, so the important question now is why did so much effort go into rooting out the perverse? I have talked before now how perverse is everything opposed to what is considered to be normal or natural. Uh, we might be thankful to Sigmund Freud for answering this question. According to Freud, sexual activity is um, for the express purpose of attaining pleasure. And procreation can only be a secondary objective, um, but, but it is projected as a prerequisite. Before Freud, any kind of non-procreative sexual activity was considered to be pathological and perverted. But according to Freud, every human child is born as polymorphously perverse and innately bisexual. And these aspects are repressed through the act of primal repression. But primal repression cannot be relied upon to act in an infallible way. Therefore, sexual normality is precariously achieved and maintained. It is simply a facade which is maintained for certain purposes. If we are talking about desire as pleasure, might as well talk of Vatsayan, whom you know, who you know is the author of a very controversial text called the Kama Sutra. Uh, in, according to the Indian Shastras, there are four aspirations that a human being should have in life, the Chotur Borgo, Dharma, Ortho, Kam, and Mokho. So we see that Kam or desire is, it is one of the four pillars of human life, but it is never given such importance. It was Vatsayan who devoted this very well-researched volume to the arts of pleasure and the art of love. But there is a very strong discomfort regarding it. There are some relaxations. In popular culture, we will see uh, newly married husbands very timidly gifting a copy of Kama Sutra to their wives. And often newly married couples would be going on honeymoons to uh, the Khajuraho temples to, to, to contemplate on the erotic sculptures on the walls of the temple of Kandarya Mahadev. Uh, but what we conclude is that any idea or text which is devoted to uh, sexuality aimed at the attainment of pleasure is bound to be considered as problematic in society and nothing short of pornographic. That would bring me to this, uh, to the ideology and the lifestyle known as BDSM. We um, have a, a schematic diagram at the bottom left, which gives us the various uh, full forms of BDSM. And no discussion on queer is complete without uh, contemplating briefly on Marquis de Sade on the left, who was the father of sadism, and Leopold von Seyscher Massoc, the uh, proponent of masochism. Um, and uh, these pursuits were aimed at the attainment of pleasure through a manipulation of power. Some people attain sexual enjoyment through the wielding of power, while for some, the relinquishing of power leads to sexual titillation and enjoyment, as the case may be. Uh, many people are under the misconception that BDSM is something extremely patriarchal, something barbarous, but what they miss is that BDSM is supposed to be consensual, which heteronormativity is not. So that's the catch. And concluding with a rather a uh, remarkable and disturbing image of the goddess Kali. Uh, we are all aware of the normal visualization of goddess Kali standing on the chest of her husband, Lord Shiva, but that is simply a euphemism for the goddess 
engaged in sexual intercourse with her husband, as is corroborated by several texts on Tantra. And I believe many of you know that this position is called the Viparitrati, or the reverse coitus, opposite. The opposite to what? This is supposed to be a classic example of queering in Indian culture, where the woman on top is radically challenging all ideas of straightness and heteronormativity. And we see here the basic issues of this presentation summarized in a bulleted list. I would uh, request the students to go through them while I make the concluding remark of today's presentation on queer. Um, when I was a student of the Queer Studies course back in JU, I had a realization which I shared with my friends. And little did I know that I would one day get the opportunity to talk about it before such a large audience. Uh, I had in mind trees. What is the basic notion of trees in society? There is a sloka in the Vaishnav tradition which proceeds Trinadapi Sunichena Tarariva Shahisnuna. Sahishnuna, sorry, which means that a Vaishnav should be as humble as grass, as lowly as grass, and as endure, enduring, Shohishnu, as a tree. A tree is a giver, a perpetual giver. It gives fruit, uh, sh shade, and uh, flowers, and doesn't protest in spite of all the atrocities uh, performed by humanity on them. But within the plant kingdom, there are other kinds of trees as well. I'm talking about the carnivorous plant, such as the Venus flytrap and the pitcher plant. And this is a very good example of diversity. They too qualify as plants, but note to what extent they challenge the traditional idea of a plant. So this is how and why queer studies is important. A growing consciousness of queer helps us to understand diversity, accept difference, and also critique power and understand how power often limits human potential and capability. Thank you very much for your audience and your time today. I will stop sharing my screen and also I would take the liberty of posting a brief reading list on queer. I've already taken permission from uh, Professor Dhor about this. I would be posting this within the chat box. Um, I don't think it, just give me a minute, sorry about this. Okay, the non-fiction part did not come, I'll just. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, are you muted? Yes, I'm sorry about it. I'm sorry about it. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Chandra. That was fascinating. And uh, I heard both of you with rapt attention. Uh, Monique Inkini made a very scholarly presentation, as uh, you rightly pointed out. And your presentation was on the spectrum, covering the entire board of it. Okay, It was wonderful. Uh, if I may add, um, uh, Professor Chandra quoted from none other than uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he referred to his Shikshashtakam, Trinada Pisuni Chena. Uh, unfortunately, that's the only thing that is that remains of uh, Chaitanya's actual writing. Secondly, if I may be permitted to add on, I'm I'm feeling extremely tempted. Uh, you referred to. Kali as Viparita Ratatura. Uh, so now, uh, this is a portrayal of Kali as visualized by none other than Krishnananda Agambagish. Uh, but there are certain other allusions, Dhyana Shlokas, which 
do not allow to um, allude to Kali in this uh, tradition. But that does not mean to, I'm not, that does not say that uh, Kali is not part of this tradition or she is uh, not uh, in, I mean, we are not in conformity with the tradition when we describe uh, Kali in such a way, in such a manner. In fact, uh, if you visit Nodia, uh, Krishnananda perhaps comes from Shantipur. If you visit Nodia, there is a Kali temple established by the royals of Krishnanagar where you will see Kali in Vipalita Ratatura, Anandamai Kali. But she is all put in sari, so you cannot see the actual statue. She is always clothed like that. So that was those two, just to add on to Professor Chandra. And I was uh, really, very really happy with both the presentations. And if we can have some questions, some interactions, it will be really wonderful. Sir, we could perhaps start with your comments, sir. Well, first of all, I think, you know, uh, this was a very interesting session. Both the speakers gave us much uh, thought, or at least food for thought. And uh, uh, I would, uh, what I found particularly interesting about both the presentations was the it was given to us. Uh, but for Shomoji, I have a specific uh, uh, observation, not really a question, an observation, let's say. And that is, you see, uh, one of the problems of doing queer in a country like India be very derivative in our discourse. That is, what I found was very interesting in your presentation was the bringing up of the indigenous Indian perspective and the theorization, which is not entirely Western, around us. Actually, to you all, and I do hope that you're going to take this forward. Because you see, it's time that we as theorists, we as critics, we as thinkers, we as young intellectuals or senior intellectuals like me, it's time that you know we started thinking about uh, maybe navigating, passing the Western ideological tradition, and looking to our own roots and trying to devise methods and visions and perspectives that we take from the West. So once again, good to hear you. I enjoyed your talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you also. Thank you, Monique. We have quite a few uh, messages in the chat box and um, congratulating both our young scholars today. Uh, but we really don't have any questions so far. Uh, sir, I, could... I have a question for you. Yeah. Good yes. evening, sir. Yes. Good I'm evening, welcome. everyone. Good evening. Okay, sir. So, so I want to ask you that you talked about Kama Sutra. Yes. So I just wanted to know that is Kama Sutra an Indian concept? And if yes, why there is such an escape from it? I mean, why people uh, really don't find a room to explore it in studies per se? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Anu, uh, for that question. Uh, yes, I would definitely say that, uh, well, uh, Though the, we, we might have heard of the existence of um, erotic, erotica in Western literature for that matter. For instance, the Amores of Ovid. Uh, this, is, uh, this can be considered, apart from being an Indian erotica, instance of Indian erotica, Kama Sutra may be considered to be an entire guide to the art of love. And as I said, uh, there well, there is a spirit of conservatism in Indian society that is almost synonymous with us. And till date, uh, we see that 
people tend to consider this pursuit of sexuality simply for the purpose of pleasure to be highly problematic and threatening because uh, i would also like to point out that calm happens to be one of the shadow ripu or the six enemies of humanity calm krodh lobh moho mod matshorjo so desire if allowed to run unchecked might lead to problematic spaces but then again the shastras say that the first three ripus calm krodh and lobh must be conditioned since they are incentives for survival for human beings and the last three mod moho and matshorjo should be eliminated since they are the more fatal i would attribute this discomfort which you speak of to the conservatist spirit in indian society uh, and uh, perhaps a lack of exposure to sexual consciousness from a younger age for that matter uh professor chandri if i can just add on to yes. what you just said uh, apart from this the shadow ripus there is the concept of the purusharthas the four yes. purusharthas dharma artha kama and moksha so of this you you know you are free without the pursuit of the four you cannot have a full life exactly so just putting it short in order to achieve liberation or moksha you will have to trod the path of ortho and kama by staying steadfast in dharma that's the check now uh, the beauty of the classical indian society was that even vatsyayana was considered a sage maharshi that was the status given to him he was considered a man of science a man of letters and uh, what we reflect uh, on kama sutra today as a text is perhaps a very narrow short version of it kama sutra is divided into several books and it has a lot to talk about human experience ways of life compatibility resourcefulness and a lot of other things so it's one of the monumental texts that classical masters produced and it's quite unfortunate that uh, in a, even in a modern society we shy away from discussing the whole text we use the text for business purpose we use the text for you know commenting on it in terms of entertainment or making a movie out of it but we never discuss the text as a whole there is the short form i am sure uh, we will soon have uh, you know young and uh, brave scholars who would like to discuss the text as a whole and write a modern commentary on it definitely one so one more question um, followed by this one if at all i can ask please um, yeah. so if uh, this kama sutra is a part of uh, we can say a book which can be uh, given to students for study in future so um, will there be a chapter on draupadi as a as a content because uh, she is a part of when she asked she has a desire of men of different virtues and that's the reason she was uh, given uh, the blessing of having six husbands so this is a part which is breaking the stereotypes breaking the tradition the concept of uh, uh, called a traditional woman cannot have it all this very concept of draupadi is breaking it again so do you think that this can be considered as a part of this gender studies uh would uh, professor boshu like to respond to it or since she mentioned gender or was I, it directed exclusively so any anyone anyone can address my question okay since it's a continuous yeah since it's a continued question so maybe if shomojit wants to take it and then maybe if necessary i can just part in okay thank you professor boshu uh i would like to say that uh, indeed draupadi you know uh, she is indeed one of the several controversial uh, characters i mean there has been a lot of controversy surrounding the character both in literature and in uh, modern thought about her um, as far as including her with yes of course in the broad 
purview of discussion, she of course can be included. But within the text of, uh, I don't, I don't uh, see a way to place her within the text in any way. Uh, but for that matter, uh, this idea of polyandry, which you touched upon, uh, this is though this might not have existed in a concrete form in any part of the world, for that matter, it is definitely hinted at in certain texts of Western literature. For instance, I talked about Frederick Engels and his uh, text on the origin of um, on the origin of uh, hang on, give me a minute. I tend to yeah on the origins of family, uh, private property, and state. Uh, there, Engels talks about the concept of heterism where women uh, at a certain point in time had the right to engage in sexual activity with as many men as they wanted to. And it was specifically at the point which I was talking about, the Middle Ages in European society where the feudal system sets in and she is restricted to the monogamous relationship. And then there has been the Devdasi tradition in India. Uh, Nayon Shannal writes this beautiful book. It's in Bengali. I don't know whether there is an English translation available or not. Shutonukaikti Devdashi Nam. And he, produce, he gives us an extremely erudite take on the Devdashi tradition of India and how uh, there is this elaborate con of featuring the Devdashi as the consort of the divine, but at the same time treating her as a prostitute. So there have been these undercurrents in society, and definitely they deserve to be taken up in a discussion regarding the Kama Sutra. Thank you. I would just uh, add, perhaps, uh, to what Anu was saying, that uh, the interpretation of Draupadi has often been uh, very different from what it was in Mahabharat. And uh, now, after Mahabharat, where you are uh, actually placing Draupadi, whether you are placing her in Mahashita Devi, or whether you are placing her in uh, Palace of Illusion. So the idea is to reread. So I don't know if it can be placed in a text, but you can say that if uh, the character of Draupadi can be read or reread, then that is not, I don't find it to be uh, very relevant to the reading of uh, Kama Sutra in a uh, academic environment. I, I don't think they go parallel. So, yeah, my opinion. Uh, I think uh, there is a question for Professor Chandra from Miraz Hook. Uh, Miraz Hook has asked Can the phenomenon of Ardhan Arishwar be studied from the framework of queer studies? Definitely, definitely. Uh, Ardhan Arishwar happens to be, uh, happens to fit into the category of the androgynous. And uh, not only in Hinduism, but in religions all over the world, we have seen this androgynous figure, uh, the, you know, this uh, figure of Agditis, uh, who is cloven into two, one a goddess, Cybele, who was an Anatolian goddess, and Attis, her male lover. And that's a story which has been included in the corpus of Greek myth. And ordinary sure as well can be... Um, included in any discussion on queer studies. And for that matter, if we look at the third gender community of India, which is more popularly known as the Hijra community, we must have noted that they tend to worship Lord Shiva, several manifestations of Lord Shiva and certain goddesses. For instance, the Bahuchara Mata is very sacred to the Hijra community of India. Uh, so, yes, indeed, there have always been these myths within India, so to speak, all over the world, which celebrate androgyny. So, thank you for your question. Mm, uh, Kathakuli has raised a hand. Kathakuli, you have something to ask? Uh, good evening, everyone. My question is for, most, uh, for Professor Chandu. Uh, as you talked about Kali, as we all know that Kali has been taken, the concept of Kali and Shakti, has been taken uh, into the nationalist movement of India uh, has given a very much has given very much importance in the movement. So my question is why Kali, why a female figure uh, is taken as the um, unitary factor of the nationalist idea, not a male figure? What's your idea? Yes. So thank you for your question, Kothakuli. 
uh, not just Kali. Kali, uh, I would of course draw in Anundumot at this point. Uh, that uh, that unforgettable episode when um, the fem the male protagonist is being shown three emanations of the goddess. Ma ki chilen, what the goddess was. Ma ki hoechen, what she has become and what she will become. Uh, so the nationalist movement uh, has, as its, uh, I mean, I mean, it draws inspiration from the visualization of the country as goddess, and so it originates from the idea of the earth as goddess. It's always Gaia, the Earth Mother or Bhumi Devi in India, and so if you visualize that your mother has been enslaved by foreign powers. It acts as a stronger incentive to leap into the freedom struggle and try to liberate one's uh, country. However, since India has been a land of diverse races, creeds, and religions, the idea of visualizing the country as a goddess has been problematic to other communities who have con considered this to be idolatrous. But what I would say is that not only Kali, uh, the if you look at Obanindranath Thakur's illustrations of Bharat Mata, you would see that she is more akin to the figure of Jagod Dhatri, who is a bountiful mother goddess. And Kali, Kali, within Anandamot, she was the present condition of India. Um, certain visualizations of Kali show her as a hag, as this emaciated hag who, who disabled hair is running through crematoriums. India similarly has been impoverished by a century of foreign dominion. So I would say Kali acts as an exhortation to action, to she is Shakti. So she exhorts the revolutionaries to jump into action and try to rescue the motherland from the foreign yoke. So uh, that's thank about. you for the answer, Professor Chandra. But I also always found that uh, because it was mostly a male dominated uh, revolution thus mm -hmm. might be a female figure uh, can be a factor of uh, unitizing the whole uh, idea. I found that in when I th thought that could be a point yes definitely yes thank you sir thank you very much. Um, so there is uh, one more question from showman uh, this one also for professor Chandro as far as I know uh, Teresa <coughs> rejected the term queer theory three years after the conference in 1990, <coughs> feeling that people were not using it in political or critical way that she had intended. This is my observation. What should be your comment on it, sir? Uh, yes, you are right. Teresa de Lortis did reject the term queer theory because she felt that her understanding of the term had not found resonance with the entire uh, the, the population of uh, uh, US at that point in time. But as I said, that uh, queer again is a, you know, it can't be fixed anywhere, uh, whether it be in terms of ideology or anything for that matter, identity politics, uh, queer cannot be pinpointed, it cannot be provided with a concrete definition. Like I said that there has been a lot of controversy regarding which categories should be included under the queer umbrella and which not. So it's a term which is very dynamic, it is ever changing and uh, naming these categories can also become a challenge which and people need to remain vigilant and all uh, constantly conscious of the changing patterns of human proclivities over time. Uh, thank you, Professor Chandro. I think now we have uh, come to the close of the session. And it was wonderful discussing this less talked about, less explored, academically explored territories, uh, which are so pertinent in our times or any functioning society that lives on you know democratic values it is also a window to re-examine reassess and comment on what has come down to us to our tradition or if i may use a sanskrit bengali word parampara i'm sure 
we will have more platforms like this to explore the unexplored or less talked about territories in our academia. And I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Chandra and Professor Goshu, who have agreed to come forward and share their expertise, their knowledge, their reading and assessment on these areas with us. Uh, we are really happy, proud, and privileged. Thanks to both our speakers. And I must thank uh, the university, the Sister Nivedita University, and the authorities at Sister Nivedita University for having agreed not only to this proposal from our department, but to every proposal from our department and actively encouraging us in all the programs that we come up with. And I am sure our the talk that we have started today, the series that we have begun today, literature talks, will, you know, we should wish it Godspeed and great success in the coming weeks and months. And we help to get more young people coming and discussing their areas of interest and expertise with all of us. Uh, once again, a big thank you to both the speakers of the day, to all of you in the audience, and a big thank you to Sister Nivedita University. Thank you. Also, thanks is also due to our mentor and advisor, Professor Dhar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. And uh, maybe just uh, leave now. And I mean, or is there no. a closing remark by, sir? No, sir has already left. Uh, I think we can. Thank you so much.